sometimes you got to bet on yourself. YouTube, YouTube, what is going on? I'm your host, Runaway Child, and I'm back at y'all with another one. If you're not subscribed to the channel, go ahead, hit that subscribe button right now. And if you're already subscribed to the channel, hey, throw a like on this video. A like don't cost you anything. It is for free. So please show your boy some love. But anyway, what I got for y'all today is a young lady by the name of Sarita Willingham. If you haven't heard of her before, please go look her up. She is doing her thing. If you are in the logistics, transportation, warehousing, whatever, she is doing her thing. When I tell you she's doing her thing, I'm talking about to the tunes of three million a year. I saw this story over on uh, Truck and Hustle TV, Truck and Hustle TV. I'll leave the link in the description box for y'all to go and see the full length video. I won't show the whole video here. I'll just break it down into bits and pieces and give y'all my take as the video goes. She went from being fired from Coca-Cola during the pandemic and she made a 360 turnaround. Went from getting a regular paycheck, working a regular job, and she turned her whole career around. She has an amazing story. I'm Sarita, the founder and CEO of SJW Logistics. I am from Georgia, a little small town, one traffic light, Bartow, Georgia. <laughs> Bartow, Georgia. Okay. So um, I grew up here in Georgia, went to college here in Georgia, and ended up moving to Powder Springs, Georgia uh, here. I started my career in corporate America at Coca-Cola as a, a project manager slash business analyst. And then I moved from Coca-Cola supply chain department to XPO Logistics, where I was an executive IT project manager. And from there, I was able to learn a lot about logistics from the top down. So that is how my career got started when I saw, oh, this is how they do it. Let me see if I could do that, too. COVID released me. COVID. <laughs> yes. The pandemic, they laid me off because all of the projects I was working on got put on hold. And okay. they said, we no longer need your services. So how many people did they, did they let go of at that time? Was it only you or is it multiple no, people? It was it was it was a tough decision for them because they were in the middle of one of their biggest projects and it was a decision where we let go of our actual employees or our contractors okay and they needed their contractors because they were doing development on that new system that was supposed to launch pretty soon so okay. i know it was a good bit of employees from all across the u.s that they let go and it was hit the hardest got it and this is 2020 obviously yes. now i know from talking to you previously at some point you started a trucking company you got yes. into trucking right so how does yes. how does that happen so um my best friend from high school him and i talked every day and he's been driving trucks since we got out of high school okay. so i have been telling him for years that i wanted to get into trucking and i actually had a tutoring business a tutoring franchise at the time and okay I said, i'm gonna close this down a tutoring franchise yes i was part of um i had franchise with club z in okay. home tutoring yeah and i was like this job that I have now is it, so demanding. I can't run my business like I was and I can't find good help. So I'm just going to close it down. And But I still want a business. And he was like, you've always wanted a trucking company. And he, he talked to me for a good year saying, you know, are you going to do it? You're going to do it. And he told me all the different things that he went through. But he was like, I know a lot of things have changed over the years. So educate yourself. So right. I kind of he went from being like best friend, brother to mentor. <laughs> you know, you hear what the streets say, buy a truck, put a driver in it. You make a lot of money. Right. right. So that sounds right. easy, right? Yeah. It sounds real easy. Sure. Well, my first truck was a lemon. OK. It burned down in its first year. It burned down? Burned down to the ground. How'd that happen? Um, I, We don't know the truck clutch got stuck according to the driver oil pan fell out fire caught and i was seven months pregnant oh wow <laughs> so i still have a facetime where i'm like <laughs> that's my truck because he said a fire right so i said you can't go put that out with a fire extinguisher and he was like uh let me facetime you and i'm like oh you mean a real fire oh so, wow. yeah it, it burned down but i had so much trouble with that truck right um and this like is the one you the, bought when when you first started the business in 2017 yes. you started yes. okay yes got you and it was like wow you know uh, my first year a truck fire yeah so i had but within my first year i had leased on owner operators 
Okay. So I had three other people working for me. Okay. And how'd you know to do that so early? My friend, my mentor. Okay. I tell you, he became from okay. a brother, got you. best friend. So to he mentor. gave you the game. Yeah. How to grow, how to he scale. Was, yeah. He was like, after you get in, you learn some things within your first year, you can lease on, on an operating level under your authority. Yeah. So I had, uh, after I made one year, I had leased on three owner operators. And when my truck burned down, it was like, well, you still got enough coming in to sustain and not have to close the business down and you have the job too right yes so you still you still that supplements as well yes right yes. What, what type of freight were you running at that time we were doing mainly drive-in drive-in yes. working the load boards and yes. just kind of like day-to-day figuring it out yes okay exactly. over the road yes okay got yes. did you have a dispatcher or were you dispatch the truck yourself it was kind of i had i was dispatching myself but I'm a project manager, so it became a project, right? Let me teach you how to book your own loads. <laughs> okay. And that way you don't interfere with my job. Got it. And I forward the rate cons to you because you're booking them yourself. You know the rates and everything. You pick up and deliver, and then in my free time and downtime, uh, after work or on weekends, I will invoice this <laughs> there. Right. But, only th- you know, I had it set up like this is how we are going to do things. So, so you gave the, dr- the drivers that much autonomy? Yes. Okay. Got yes. you. Got you. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that worked out for you in terms it of did. it was profitable and everything. It did. Okay. Those drivers are still with all of them except one are still with me today. And I said, you know what? I don't want to go back to corporate America. So my husband and I, we sat down and talking. He was like, I've been telling you for a year, you could have left anyway. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was like, you're the late one here, right, right, you know. Right. And so I, um, once I got laid off, I contacted Hope. Okay. And told her what happened because she had asked me a couple weeks before that, like, why are you still working? Right. <laughs> so when she did that, um, when I told her about it, she sent me an email or some people were looking for uh, minorities to do a contract with Ikea, but you had to be asset based. Okay. And I was asset based. Yeah. And it was here in Georgia. And we picked up in Savannah and delivered to Atlanta for Ikea seven days a week. So with that contract and all of the funding that they gave out in 2020 for the businesses, I was able to go from five trucks to 12 trucks Mm. by that uh, October. So we expanded. And then by that December, we decided, well, what do we want to invest in? Because we don't want to just depend on trucking revenue uh, per se, because you know how that goes. They'll they're up and down. So we decided to say, well, what other business are we going to open? We thought about roadside because we got robbed with roadside a lot. <laughs> right, 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 right. You're like, they're definitely making money. <laughs> yes, yes. And then we thought about the brokerage again, but none of us are really salespeople um, yeah. there per se. Yeah. And we would like, we don't have the staff in place at this time and we landed on warehousing location was big to me because i'm still a family person i'm still a mom you know so it's not too far from my home and my kids in school but the other thing was i wanted to be in an industrial location i had to consider trucks being able to get in and out you know i did a market analysis those people around there to be able to hire them so we did a lot to really determine what was the right location and then douglasville has this improvement project where they're trying to build and hire more in douglasville so that went into the the thought process Mm. but the other thing that was really like the deciding factor we started talking to some of our customers on the trucking side that said that trusted us that knew us and said hey if we got into warehousing would y'all be willing to work with us on the warehousing side and they were like yes so being honest i started my warehouse in my garage because when i told one customer about it (laughs) they were like yeah they were like yeah either way i got to be out by december 1st so i know your warehouse is not going to be ready to february but can you take over this and figure it out for me so we were in my garage with UPS picking up every day from my house in wow. December of 2020. We had also picked up a dedicated lane through our broker that gave us the uh, IKEA contract with Home Depot, doing that, going from Texas to Georgia. And then we had a flatbed come on. So we onboarded flatbed and we onboarded Reefa. So we were doing that over the road as well. So we, we want, I always keep my business diverse. Yeah. I don't want to depend on one line or one income because what happened 
Um, a perfect example is after having the contract with IKEA for a year, they decided to close down the Savannah location to move it to Florida. So with us, we have all semi trucks. When they're saying asset based, they want you to have the assets. They don't want to go through a third party broker to find the assets. Um, a lot of shippers, manufacturers, distributors, their customers or they don't want to have a middleman in place because they feel it's an extra added cost and everybody wants to save money. Right. So being asset based is is definitely a way to get more dedicated contracts um, there, but they're having the right amount of volume. So the way we approach things, which a lot of people don't think to do, is to um, ask them to scale. Say, can you give me a scalable contract? Because that's how our IKEA contract started out. Um, mm. They only want to give us, I think, three loads a day for th five days a week. Mm -hmm. But then when they saw we came ready, <laughs> there we had trucks waiting and we were on time. I remember my drivers was delivering early. I'm like, you can't bring over the road drivers in and make them local. They, it doesn't work. But I remember that. Right. And they were like, oh, we need you to take over everything. When they told me the volume, I knew I had never did that before. And I knew I had the capacity trucking wise, but I knew my team, my drivers and what they were capable of. So I said, well, you know, I don't want to look bad. You know, good first impression. For sure. For sure. <laughs> there. And I said, well, listen, I know y'all already have a carrier on it. I don't mind taking over all the business. I'm fully confident that we can handle the whole thing. But can we scale into it? Maybe we start out the first week with this or the second week with that or maybe the first month here or there. But when we started out, like I say, it was like three loads a day for the first five day or for five days a week. And then by the end of that week, they were like, can you please take over it? We, they didn't want to <laughs> wait to the time to for us to scale up. And we were like, sure, right. we could do that. And the biggest challenge we saw where we do a lot of business in Savannah, but we're here in Lithia Springs. So our location uh. <laughs> is not ideal for some of our customers. So that was one challenge. Then the other challenge was we target small to medium sized businesses which a lot of them are great product owners. They have this really unique product that they sell online or they're trying to get into a retailer, but they don't include their logistics and shipping. Mm. So then they come to me and say, Saritha, I need to get this delivered and this particular customer or you know, carrier wants $3,000 to go 800 miles. And I'm like, yeah, that's logistics. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. Yes, that, that's logistics. But they didn't put that into their pricing when they did their contract with their retailer or whoever they did it with when they got it manufactured. Mm. They didn't include shipping costs. So it's like, I need you to help me out. Well, I can help you out. But, you know, those, those challenges is they don't have the money up front. So a lot of times in trucking, you got to pay those drivers in five to seven days. Right. <laughs> so they trying to, that was a challenge trying to educate. She has warehouses. She has stock. She has a counseling service. She has a mentor service. And she's right in Atlanta. She's from Georgia. For someone watching who's interested in warehousing, again, everybody's always, always interested in price. Like, how do you uh, build the business model for, like, warehousing? Well, and I know that's a big question, but like as much as you could explain it. For well, me. that's a good question yeah. because I actually did that okay. before we moved us up. Before I even signed the paperwork, I said, well, let me see how much this warehouse is going to cost because that's going to determine how much cash flow I need, how much staff I need um, as well. And I remember estimating what my monthly costs would be fixed and, you know, non-fixed costs. And to this date, I'm still on target. <laughs> there, really? Yes. Because I was like, I need to know all my costs before I move in. Because the other thing, I need to make sure my trucking side was going to be able to support the warehousing until it was able to hold its own. So Got it was it. very important to know the cost. Uh, because, like I said, you don't want to get in something and then you don't have customers or you don't have what you need to be successful. So one thing I always tell people, go find out your costs. What are your fixed costs? What are your variable costs? What it, will it take? If you don't have that business analysis, that's that's a bad start. How does the how does the trucking side intersect with the warehousing side or are they just two different businesses? They are two different businesses, but the beauty in us, what I love is that we can offer it all on one invoice. So the trucking side complements. If our customers have product they need us to pick up from somewhere in uh, any 
of the 48 states in the U.S. or go to the port a lot of times, we could pick it up and deliver it to our own warehouse and we could charge you for the trucking, the unloading, the palletizing, whatever we have to do, we could charge you for that all on one invoice. We could deliver it, we could store it, we could ship it out to your customers, whatever you need, we can handle all your logistics in one, one um, invoice. But the other thing about it is, even if we don't have capacity or the assets available at that time and you need a shipment picked up in, say, for instance, Texas, and we don't have any trucks in Texas and you need it bought, took, taken to Philadelphia, we have a brokerage. So we could broker it out and we still give you all your services on one invoice. And when did you start the brokerage? I started it earlier this year in May. Okay, okay, mm-hmm. got you. And what was the, the method- methodology behind that, just having that full it was service <laughs> business we went through the reality this year of the supply chain shortages and maintenance issues and parts being delayed since last year and our trucks being down for a long time and our customers saying why can't you help us some other way <laughs> <laughs> right. and we're like well why can't we help you some right, other exactly. way and we asked them same thing i did with warehouse would you use us if right. we did that would you trust us you know because you've been using a different brokerage when we don't have and it was like it's a no-brainer yeah, we would use you all because we know you're going to be fair. How does SJW grow from here? What what What's next in terms of offerings? So what we're <clears throat> currently working on is making this warehouse a foreign trade zone. Okay. So we can help our customers that do imports and exports save on tariffs. Uh, we've been working with UGA Supplier, De- I mean, a Small Business Development Center because they have 12 Uh, foreign trade offices overseas so get connected to find the right customers that are right fit for us so we could take the company global wow how how difficult is that process very (laughs) (laughs) is it is it difficult because of money is it difficult because of paperwork or is it because of what Um, just a scarcity they don't allow a, a lot of you know places to be trade mm-hmm. zones like what's the difficulty in it so that's a great question it's difficult because we are a service provider we're not a supplier we don't manufacture a product a lot of times people from overseas they're looking for the buyer the person that actual there's a buyer looking for a person that manufactures the product because they want to buy it direct so it's finding the customers that the buyers that are buying stuff from our people here uh, uh, shippers here in Georgia to that manufacture it and then trying to partner with them to say well once they bought this product from you we can deliver it for you being a service provider for them so Mm. it's difficult and then we've been working with some foreign exchange companies who are telling us well if you take possession of the the product and you buy the product and then resell it there you can uh, get import and export insurance on it we'll pay for it to make until your customer pays you Mm. but it's like now that's the added cost right right (laughs) right right right. because now you want me to take possession of it and then pay that manufacturer who manufactured it then you want me to ship it which i have the shipping costs even though you're insured or you'll pay me for it it's still not the route we want to go so trying to find that that niche to say okay we want to be a service provider for those that are in that market yes okay okay i love it um man it's super super dope story um i I love how you're building a business um and just kind of like how everything kind of just really happened organically and what's the real takeaway for me is that it's just like closed mouths don't get fed man you just kind of every opportunity you've got and you've got it just through asking questions yes you know what I mean? Yes. This dude, the opportunity mm-hmm. was there. You asked the questions and you and you figured it out. Yes, that for, is true. For sure, for sure. Mm-hmm. You can find me on LinkedIn under Saritha Willingham or at SJW Logistics there. You can find me on Instagram as well as SJW Logistics. And I'm on Facebook at SJW Logistics. But we also have a SJW Trucking page as well. Okay. So we're on all those different social media platforms. And, and before you get into the final thought, you did say you, you, you said you consulted. You So you do consulting. Yes. Okay. So earlier this year to expand in our marketing and service offerings, we started a Logistical Mix University where we... Okay. Okay. We actually consult. So you weren't um, even about to talk about that. I know. I'm so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but, yeah, we have Logistical Mix University um, there. I've taught a brokering class this year. We did five-day dispatch challenge. We did five-day trucking challenges. My goal is to help people see that if you want to do it, you can. But it's a smart way to do it because as I look back, I might would have started a little differently. 
I, if I would not have betted on myself, I would not be here today. I would still be in corporate America with my comfortable paychecks every two weeks (laughs) there, (laughs) not worrying about a thing because I always just say it all pays the same. But um, by me actually betting on myself and encouraging myself and saying I can do this because I am a woman in a male dominated industry, there I have had the best partnerships with male they males they really want to help you and they really want to partner with you and a lot of my vendors are companies that are owned by males so mm. i would say don't be afraid you got to take that leap of faith get a mentor <laughs> get a coach but bet on yourself and you'll be very successful got it are, are you able to share your revenue yes yes so uh, year to date, I think we've made two point five million dollars. Nice. So nice. And we're down in revenue, of course, due to the pan uh, the pandemic and supply chain issues. Because last year we had two point eight million. So got it. Our target was to hit that three million mark, but you know what? We're gonna hit it next year. You're gonna definitely <laughs> hit it. You're gonna yes. definitely hit it. I love it. Great story. I appreciate you for spending your time with us and educating us. Saritha Willingham. Where? I know you're in the building somewhere.